Welcome to Systematic Theology Unit 8. In this unit we're going to be talking about the doctrine that distinguishes Christianity from every other world religion. The doctrine that's really the foundation for everything else that we, that we teach um, in, in our faith. And that is the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is also one of those things that is notoriously difficult to get around. It's a topic that we don't really, I think, address adequately in churches. One of the things that I regularly do with students is I, I poll the classroom that I have before me, and I ask them, how many of you are active members of, of, of evangelical Christian churches, Southern Baptist churches? And, of course, the majority of them hopefully raises their hands. They're seminary students. That's always been my opinion that the best seminary students are saved seminary students. So... Um, but what I do is I ask them this question. I said, when or have you ever heard from your church's pulpit a sermon on the doctrine of the Trinity that explains the doctrine of the Trinity to Christian believers? And usually in rooms of 40 to 45 people, I might have one or two hands raised. Which is sort of unusual to me considering um, how important this particular doctrine is, how, how limited the discussion of it really becomes in our churches. So what I want to do in this section is introduce you to some of, the, some of the issues related to the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, a lot of people are scared of the doctrine of the Trinity because it is so difficult to wrap our minds around. Let me, let me begin by making a distinction that I think will be helpful for you. Um, in, in assessing this, and it really starts with a, a legend. A legend um, that's not true, but it's, a, it's an interesting legend nevertheless. Uh, Saint um, Augustine, uh, Saint Augustine according to this legend, was uh, walking along the beach one day and he s was sitting, you know, doing what theologians do. He, he probably, um, you know, was was you know, walking around mulling over this difficult theological concept of the Trinity. And he's walking along, thinking about the Trinity, and he sees this little boy playing there on the beach. And the little boy has dug a little hole in the sand. And Augustine starts sort of watching him and seeing what he's doing. And the little boy is, is going from the beach where this hole is dug out to the water and he's got his hands cusp like this. He goes out to the water and he scoops up water and he runs back and he puts it in the hole. He goes back and he scoops up water and he puts it back in the hole. And Augustine watches him do this several times and just out of curiosity he walks up to the boy and he says, what are you doing? And he says, the little boy says, I'm trying to move the ocean into the hole. And Augustine says, well, you know, there's no way you're ever going to be able to fit the whole ocean in that little hole. And the little boy looks up to him and says, that's right. Just like there's no way you're going to be able to fit the whole doctrine of the Trinity into your little mind. And, uh, and then the, the creepy kind of part of the legend the little boy disappeared and Augustine was just standing there on the beach by himself and sort of like one of those weird things you see on Unsolved Mysteries. But um, nevertheless, there's an important point to the legend and that is we're never going to be able to comprehend exhaustively the doctrine of the Trinity. But that being said, even if we can't comprehend the doctrine of the Trinity exhaustively, what we can do is we can apprehend what the Bible says about it. And what does that mean? Well, comprehend means to have a full uh, understanding of the inner workings of the Trinity, things that no human being in this life will ever be privy to. But apprehending, which literally means seizing, grabbing a hold of, means that what we can do is we can look at what the Scripture says about the doctrine of the Trinity, and even though that specific word is not used in the Scripture, I do believe the Scripture teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. We can look at what Scripture says about the doctrine of the Trinity, and we can affirm and believe those particular things 
that are said in the Trinity. So there are three statements that I encourage when I teach the doctrine of the Trinity in, in local churches for every single Christian to try to learn. These are three very simple statements. Number one, there is one God. Christian theism is not a polytheistic religion despite the characters that some people pose to the doctrine of the Trinity. Despite what, what people like the deist in the, in, the, in the 18th century were saying about the Trinity, despite what people like the Unitarians were saying, despite what people um, in Islam will say, Christianity is the belief in one God. And this is a doctrine that is affirmed both in the Old and the New Testaments. And we'll talk about this exhaustively in the scriptural presentations um, that are going to be in this unit. But there is a belief that we have, there is one God, but there is also a belief that God the Father is God, God the Son is God, and God the Holy Spirit is God. I mean, this again, something easy for everybody to remember. God the Father is God, God the Son is God, and God the Holy Spirit is God. And there's lots of scripture for each of these claims to back those up. Again, all of which we'll explore in the PowerPoint that's in this unit. And then finally, a third statement. God is three persons. Or said another way, God the Father is not the Son. God the Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father or the Son. What we want to do is we want to make clear distinctions between the persons in the Godhead. Now, I think that this particular doctrine has great practical significance as well. And that's the reason why it was raised in the 4th century councils when they got to, to Nicaea and they were addressing this practical question that had been raised by really a heretic who was denying that Jesus was eternally um, God, that Jesus was co-eternal with the Father. And the importance of this question really boiled down to this. If Jesus isn't God, he doesn't really have the power to save us. So our salvation hung on this issue of the doctrine of the Trinity. So it's an extremely practical and extremely important issue. Now again, this is one of those things that the Bible didn't explicitly teach, but what happened was what was implicit in Scripture was made explicit over time. Again, these are things that I talk about in my book, In Defense of Doctrine, which is available on Amazon for a low, low price, I'm sure that you can find, or a local bookstore. Shameless self-promotion, done. Okay, we're going to put that aside. Going back to the Trinity. Practical questions. Practical questions that are right there for us to discuss. One of which is, how do we pray? How do we worship? Is it appropriate to pray to the Son? Is it appropriate to pray to the Holy Spirit? Is it appropriate to worship all three persons of the Trinity? So this is not only a practical question that's relating to um, our salvation, but it's also a practical question that relates to our daily practices of prayer and worship. So it affects every area of the Christian life. So that's what we're going to be discussing here in Unit 8.